Oh, good evening. Can you hear me? Oh, yes, now. Good evening. My name is Jorn Weisbrot. I'm the artistic director of the Luminato Festival, and welcome everyone to our last Times Talk Luminato on our last day of the festival. I'm very sad that it's over, but um, my health is also going to be very happy about this. Um, we've had an amazing 10 days. We had, this is the fourth Times Talk, and um, it's a great privilege to be partnering with um, one of the greatest newspapers in the world, the New York Times, on this series of, uh, cons uh, of, this series of um, talks and um, hold them here at the Mars Center, uh, which partner with us on, um, on this amazing series of talks. And it is my great pleasure to have David Byrne tonight, who, yes, David. <laughs> um, who maybe some of you saw yesterday um, at the Sony Center at a show that we produced called If I Loved You, Gentlemen Prefer Broadway. Oh, you did. And um, as Rufus mentioned yesterday, for those of you who um, haven't been there, which you should feel really sorry about, um, David was really one of the, he was the, the first person who immediately said yes, um, I think because he was you know, excited of exploring this new kind of direction, although it's not really that kind of a new direction for him because he's written a fantastic, fantastic Broadway music, or a musical. It's not on Broadway, it's at the Public Theater. It's still running there called Here Lies Love, and if you are in New York, you should really check it out. It's a wholly new experience. And um, so then once we had David Byrne sort of confirmed, you know, it was really easy to get everyone else because it was like, well, if David Byrne is doing it, you know, you should be doing it as well. So um, I'm not going to hold up much longer. Um, I want to introduce my friend and colleague, Carol Day from the New York Times, um, who's going to say a few words and then we'll give the floor over to um, the amazing two people here on stage. Thank you so much for being here, and thank you so much for enjoying and embracing the Illuminato Festival here in Toronto. Thank you. Hello, everyone. It's so great, and thank you, Jorn. It's great to be here at, in Toronto at Illuminato, working with you and everyone on the team to bring Times Talks to the festival. And we're delighted to have these Times Talks on our own website, timestalks.com. So if you want to check them out after, they'll be there. And this evening, as Jorn said, we're excited to have such a distinguished creative artist and musical talent with us. And you'll hear much more about him and his work from our moderator. Times readers count on him for the insider take on what to see and listen to. He spreads his knowledge of music by writing for the arts pages, covering music for the media section, and contributing to the popular weekly musical podcast from the Times, and by teaching a course at NYU and hosting a radio show. He's also the author of Doolittle, a book about the Pixies. Please join me in welcoming New York Times media reporter Ben Cesario and our very special guest, David Byrne. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for, for being here. Um, we have lots of stuff to talk about. Um, and uh, we're also going to have uh, time for questions at the end of the interview. So think of, uh, think of some good questions. Um, David, I want to start with the idea of collaboration in, in your music. Um, in the introduction, we heard about the show last night where you were singing Broadway show tunes. Um, you have uh, a show at the Public Theater in New York, Here Lies Love, which you did with Fat Boy Slim. Um, a month or so ago, I saw you at BAM with a whole bunch of people paying tribute to William Anyebor, uh -huh. right? The, nor the, uh, the uh, Nigerian musician. You've made records with St. Vincent. 
uh, dirty projectors, and these are just a lot, the few of the recent ones in a career going way, way back doing lots of interesting music with interesting people. What role does collaborating with, with other people sort of play in your career, how you make music and how you go about deciding what kind of projects you're working on? I, re I really like it. Uh, it gets me out of, outside of myself, outside of my own little preoccupations and tendencies and habits. I have to, I'm forced to sort of adapt somewhat to what the other person does and what they, they tend to like to do. Um, yeah, sometimes the hardest part for writing is to, right at the beginning, going, what do I have to say? Mm -hmm. what do, where do I begin? And if somebody else is there, they can sometimes make the first move. Or you can do some little thing and then pass it to them, and they, they send it back, and you've started the momentum. So it's a lot easier than, sometimes it's easier than kind of doing it yourself. Although, sometimes there's no choice. <laughs> Do you, do you usually start thinking, this is someone I would like to work with, and, and so I'll come up with a project for it? Or do you, do you sort of have the music and find the project as a result? Oh, it works both ways. With the, uh, the, the musical I did with Fat Boy Slim, um, I had the idea that I wanted to do a kind of dance music, disco musical about Imelda Marcos. And <laughs> Of course. This was a number of years ago. It's not as odd as it sounds. She loved going to dance clubs and discos. She had a mirror ball in her New York townhouse. And that's, that, that, the, she came, that music was a constant. So I just thought, if there's a story there, this is the way to tell it. Um, and at some point, I thought, I need help with the you know, I, I have a feeling for a groove, but I thought the sounds and the really specifics of the dance music world, I think I could use help in that department. So I, I'd never met him before. I got in touch with Fat Boy Slim. He lives in Brighton, two hours south of London, and um, explained it to him. And he said, sure, why not? I think he had no idea that I was going to send him like 23 songs and go, <laughs> OK, get busy. Here we <laughs> So wh why him? Why, why was he the guy? Uh, he was the guy because before he was a, a DJ, whatever you call it, kind of a DJ music song guy, he was in a band. He was in a band called the House Martins, and he played bass. So I thought, this is a guy that knows, he, as opposed to other DJs that do 10 minutes of beat and no structure at all. This guy knows what a song is. He may not do it that often, but he knows what it is. Um, and <laughs> so somewhere in his mind, he has that. He also you know, knows what kind of the, the arc of a song is. Whereas if you're purely in the DJ world, you may, have, it may just be a completely foreign concept. He also does, his music to me has a, there's a sense of humor to it. And it doesn't all, every song isn't always the same genre, the same kind of dance music genre. So it's not like I only do house music or I only do techno. He'll do things in different styles. So I thought that's good because I want to kind of cover a variety of sounds. So that, that, there was a decision process there. But it sounds like you sort of narrowed it down like, hmm, that, might, that guy that's might be guy. interesting that's, to yeah, work with. Yeah, that guy, he might say no, but I'm going to try that. That's the one I'm going to try. With uh, St. Vincent, it was, uh, it didn't come from either. I was an admirer of hers, a fan. I'd seen, you know, had her records and seen her live shows. And uh, it was an outside agency. It was a, a charity organization called Housing Works that has a, a used bookstore and used clothing and it's all AIDS charities. And they had been doing these little, uh, events in their bookstore where they asked different artists to, to perform together. And uh, I'd met Annie, that's her, her real name, and we met again at one of these little events where Bjork and uh, this group Dirty Projectors 
not only did they perform together in this little tiny bookstore, the guy from Dirty Projectors, Dave Longstreth, wrote six new songs for it. So I thought, oh, man, they raised the bar in, impossibly high. So, so they approached Annie and I separately. And it was kind of like, well, yeah, I'd, I'd work with her. Uh, if she wants to do it, I'm, I'm up for giving it a try. But we'll be, it might take us a while. Don't announce it. Um, it did take us a long time. Um, and when they did, yeah, after that other, the other show had been there, I said, well, now we have to, we can't do less. We have to come up, we have to do new songs too. That's what they've done. They've made it so that we can't just go in there and fool around. You have to really come in there with written stuff, um, which was fine. It gave us. What about uh, Rufus Wainwright? Uh, so we, we heard in the introduction there, he reached out to you, said maybe, hey, how would you like to participate in a all-male Broadway love duet show? And you said, sure? Yeah, I said, sure, which was, yeah, kind of a stretch for me. I didn't grow, I didn't grow up in that world being familiar with all those, those songs. I knew some of them, but not, there was lots of them that I could go, what's that, what's that song? What show, is that from a show? What show is it from? But uh, Rufus and I had worked together uh, a number of years ago. I, I, I was doing a pop record and I decided to do two opera arias on a pop record as if they were kind of pop songs. And knowing that Rufus is a huge opera fan, I said, so, so I'm doing, you know, one of them was a duet. And I said, between two men. And I said, will you, you know, will you do this with me? And he goes, which version are we basing it on? <laughs> <laughs> Luckily, it was his favorite version, the one that I, was the same one that I knew. So, yeah, we had worked together a little bit. So I thought, oh, this will be, be fun. This will be fun. Plus, a whole orchestra, something I, you know, I wouldn't want to pay, pay for that. But in the, <laughs> in, the, in the context of. Luckily, the government of Canada was there to <laughs> help with this. <laughs> but in the context of the concept of the show, I thought, oh, this will be so much fun. And uh, I mean, was there any part of you that thought, whoa, you, you know, why would I do something like that? Yeah, I'm not a Broadway a, guy. This yes, could go for a minute wrong. I thought, I'm not a Broadway guy. I'm not somebody who grew up in this material. And uh, it's, just not, it's not my world. There are people who are so kind of fixated on show tunes and all that kind of stuff that it's kind of like if you sing a wrong note, phew, mm -hmm. forget it. Um, so I thought, yeah, you're, you're kind of, but I thought, oh, all right. It's, if it's a mixture of people who are reverential and then others like myself who may mess up a note here and there, although I'm, I'll be doing my best, then that'll, that'll be fun. That'll be fun. Um, I, maybe not all of them, but for the most part, I totally, re uh, I'm in awe of the songwriting um, because in general, not all of them, but in general, Rufus was choosing stuff from, I guess, what, the 30s, 40s, and 50s, um, this era of kind of really classic songwriting when the kind of hit, the hit songs that were getting played on the radio all came from mm -hmm. musicals. Um, and there's a, there's a wonderful wit to them all. And yeah, they're very, they're, some are witty and clever, and some are very sentimental, and, um, yeah, they, they were the pop songs of the day, so they're really well crafted as songs. And you get, as somebody who writes songs, you go, I can learn something from this. Look at how this song is constructed and how, we're, how he did, puts the melody here and does, does this, yeah. Well, I think for your, for your fans over the years, the fact that you are willing to take that risk is something they really appreciate about what you do, that, you know, that you, you, you're going to do something that will surprise us. Um, I mean, do, do these ever go wrong? Do you ever squelch them if you try a project and it doesn't quite work out? Or I probably have. Um, I think usually it becomes evident that it's not working before I, I get, it gets to the me squelching it part. 
<laughs> All right. Um, I want to talk about your, your book um, a little bit, How Music Works. This is a terrific book. Um, Thank you. Uh, at, for one reason, because it's, it's full of ideas about music and about sort of you know, where music comes from and how people make it. And one of the really key ideas in the book is that context, different kinds of context, really have a, have a, uh, have a, have a strong influence on the, the creative process and on the music. And that's the economic contexts of you know, the people who are making it and the social context, technology, uh, even the architecture of the buildings in which people make uh, art affects it. It was, I mean, it was, a, it was a fascinating theory, but I also thought it was a surprising one to come from an artist, because in a way it seemed to diminish a little bit or lessen the idea of, well, this idea, you know, my ideas are a light bulb that just come on. I'm, a, I'm an artist that comes up with a, with a new idea. Yeah, I'm very, um, very much against that view of artists. I think that artists work, um, they respond to context, then they respond to um, the restrictions that are put on them. Rather than being like, I have an idea, or I have, I have a feeling, I mean, true, and that I have to express. And it has to be done with an orchestra of all tubas, or whatever. The, uh, I thought, no, people tend to write for what what is available to them financially or mm -hmm. technically um, within their musical abilities and all the other kinds of stuff. In general, there's, there's exceptions. And yeah, so I... Has that always been your view of it or how did you come around no, to this I, conclusion? I just, I, um, well, I, was, I think I was always from the very beginning sort of against the kind of romantic notion of the the romantic view of the artist as this, this soul that must express itself and all this kind of stuff. I thought, yes, there's the, there is that. There is that part uh, that gets expressed. Um, and I think over the years, I've gotten better at, uh, at letting that part, the heart part or whatever, come out through the, what I write. But, um, but I thought, uh, yeah, that's, but that's only one part of it's an important part, but that's only, to me, I thought that's only one part of what an artist does. There's other, lots of other things, lots of other ideas going on in whoever you, you choose, although they may put that kind of romantic notion in the foreground, because that's kind of what's accept, most acceptable. That's kind of the, what people tend to want to buy into. Uh -huh. And it makes a good story or something like that. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, so I, I didn't set out to write the book about all these contexts, but I, I had written maybe a, one chapter for an, an article for a magazine, and another one was a, uh, a, a talk that I did, the one about architecture, and I thought, oh, th I'm, I'm, both of these are about the out extra musical context affecting the kind of music that gets written and played and how it gets played and what you end up hearing is based on something outside of the actual notes. Um, so I thought, I wonder if there's more. Yeah, and I made a list and I thought, yeah, yeah, look, there's a whole list. There's, there's the money, there's the education system, there's funding, there's architecture, there's all, this, you know, all these things that feed into what makes music be the way it is. Um, one of the most interesting sides of that um, is the architecture question, the, the physical space. Um, if, if, you, if you haven't read this or seen it, there's, a, there's a, a TED talk, as you said, where it summarizes it nicely. But you go through centuries of, of music and talk about Gothic cathedrals and the, um, the, even the tonality of the music that worked well in that situation. Um, Mozart's era and how the smaller rooms allowed for more kind of ornamentation and stuff. And then you get into like rock clubs and, and jazz and about how the musicians, you know, were able to create what they created in that space. Is that something that came to you, you know, 
as you were standing on a stage looking at the space and thinking, <laughs> this is what it's going to sound like? In a manner of speaking, more it was a cumulative experience of playing some places and realizing, oh, this, this place sounds good. I mean, the, the audience can hear everything that we're doing. We can hear ourselves. There's a kind of intimacy or whatever appropriate to what we're doing at, at that kind of thing. And, and then having played other places where you go, oh, big mistake. Um, we're trying to do like a, I was, at one point I was, did a performance of this, of the, the disco musical stuff at Carnegie Hall. And for some people, depending on where they were sitting, it was fine. And for other people, it was just this cacophony because of the, it's a very reverberant room. And certain kinds of music really sound luscious and beautiful in there. And other kinds of music, especially things with a lot of drums and volume, it just turns into a mess. And I realized, oh, that's why there isn't more of this kind of music in here. <laughs> This room was really built for and to encourage an orchestra. Right? Yeah, an orchestra. And an orchestra of a certain size and it's playing a certain kind of music. And, uh, and rooms like that being built, I thought, well, that is a kind of tacit encouragement for composers and orchestras to make more of that and to kind of fill those, those kind of rooms that sound that way. So I, yeah, that's, I, it started coming to me going, oh. Yeah, so if you've ever heard like a, something, a musical act booked in what is acoustically the completely wrong place, like maybe an, an African drum group playing in a Gothic cathedral, because maybe the Gothic cathedral has uh, city funding, and so they go, oh, we're going we're gonna to put some of this cool music in here, and then you realize, oh, that was really, really bad. Um, do you ever want to sort of go against the grain, you know, like do it even if it is kind of the wrong thing, just to see what happens? I've done that, not, in, not so much intentionally, but it's happened to me. <laughs> and you just go, yeah, and then eventually you learn. Eventually you learn. There's, uh, there's one down, down downtown New York. I'm sure this place is here, too. There's a World Financial Center, which is like this giant glass atrium uh, in between whatever bank and finance buildings. And probably due to some kind of zoning thing, they have to have cultural events in there. And they book music. And, Certain kinds of music work really, really well in there, but other kinds of things, it, it is just like, <sighs> you, it's, just, it's just a total mess, yeah. So there, was, there have been times, I think, where I got invited to do something there, and I said, um, I don't have anything that, that sonically is appropriate for that space right now. Well, let's talk about Here Lies Love. This is the disco musical <laughs> based on Emile DeMarcos. Mm -hmm. And in, in some ways, this would seem to really be a, a, an embodiment of some of the ideas that you're talking about with the way a physical environment can shape the music or the performance because this is a space where you set it up kind of like a disco where the audience stands uh, on the floor and the performers are uh, at different sort of stages around them and then there's pieces of stage that kind of move and sometimes the audience has to kind of shuffle out of the way to make room for them. Um, tell me about coming up with that part of it and, and, and the idea of the space itself being part of the experience. I didn't, I didn't go to discos a lot, but I would occasionally go. And so, some evenings, this is whatever, many years ago, uh, I made a point to go if, if there was a live performance there, live kind of maybe in quotes. So you. You'd go to a, a disco, and in, in those days, they were tended to be like a giant warehouse full of people dancing. And then the, the live act would come out, and it would basically be a singer like Gloria Gaynor or Grace Jones or uh, you know, Frida Payne or whoever had a hit at that moment um, would come out, and they would have brought a little digital tape or some kind of thing with their backing tracks on, and they were called so these acts became known as track acts. 
and they would hand that to the DJ, and he would play the, the backing track. They would stand on a little teeny stage, half the size of this, um, and sing their hit song. And because they only had one hit song, they would stretch it out to be you know, eight minutes long. And then maybe if there was nice applause, they'd do it again. <laughs> <laughs> But what I noticed was, OK, that they had little tiny stages. It was a little tiny stage. And I thought, wow, what if you had uh, a show where there was a number of these tiny stages around the periphery of the room where different characters in a, kind of, in a, in a narrative sang songs one after another. And the audience is still dancing. This is as I imagine it. The audience is still dancing. And, drinking or doing whatever they're doing, uh, but they're sort of absorbing a narrative arc at the same time through these songs. And I thought, that, that could be really amazing, because normally there's no narrative arc in, in dance music. There's just whatever, the, the drug arc, or the arc of exhaustion. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so, that was, yeah, and I thought, oh, yeah, if you had some video projections on that would help kind of give more information and historical background, I thought this might be a way to do something. And then eventually, in the process of workshops and working with the director, a guy named Alex Timbers and the set designer, they, they, they liked the idea. So we went with that idea of having, although we didn't do it in a club, we recreated a club. Um, but they took it further. They said, well, what if some of the, the little platforms actually moved? Like, and you could, they could move and form a kind of ramp so that the, the uh, performers could like, perform on a ramp, like in a fashion show or something, and, and go right out into the audience and, and then emerge on the other side. And I thought, OK, yeah, let's, let's try it. I mean, we, we do things called workshops where you try these out with plywood versions and see if it works. And it did. It worked. Um, <laughs> but it, it, and I'm totally thrilled with the way it, worked, the way it uh, turned out. But it, in retrospect, I realize it can't move into a normal theater. It's, mm -hmm. we had, to move it anywhere, we have to find it's come back to the public. The yeah, it's back in the public right? now. And we found a place in um, San Francisco, an old armory. And so there's, it's, it will move, but it's, it's, it's a whole process. What is the intended sort of effect uh, in a dramatic way on oh. people watching it and feeling it in that way? I think I learned things that I didn't expect. I think my intention was that having the audience kind of be on their feet, uh, clumped together, and da maybe dancing a little bit, I thought, from my own experience going to hear music in clubs and you're standing, and you maybe get jostled a little bit, there's a certain amount of, um, you lose yourself in the, in the crowd a little bit. And, and, so there's, there's, which is pleasurable for the most part, unless it's too crowded. But for the most part, there's a, there's a pleasure in kind of losing your identity um, in the crowd that way that doesn't happen if you have a nice seat in a the theater. Um, I thought there's also a thing where you, you turn off some of your whatever critical intellectual facilities when it, it just the music's playing and people are dancing around and that kind of thing. So you start to... I thought maybe they'll absorb the story and the, the narrative and some of the emotional stuff that's going on by osmosis. They don't have to like study every every aspect of things that are going on. It'll it'll be like you know music, like when you listen to pop songs, you kind of get what's going on, but you haven't you haven't intellectually figured it out. Um, well, the story is partly about you know as it goes through the whole history of the Marcos regime about sort of a nation being swept up in this kind of promises of, hey, we're a modern society, and this is what I we're building. And, yeah. It, and then things get really ugly. Yes. Uh, I didn't realize that this would happen, but it was very fortuitous that 
the audience then mirrors the experience of the Philippine people. They, they get swept up in the glamour and the excitement of the Marcos, uh, Imelda and her husband, Ferdinand, running for election. And you have all the audience kind of cheering and cheering them on and dancing along, with, dancing with them and everything. And, you were, and of course, half the audience, not all, but some of them realize we're cheering a dictator here. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, but they're totally, as the Philippine people were, everybody's swept up in that moment and complicit in it, which is dramatically, it works out really well. Because then when the rug gets pulled out and you realize, oh, we made a big mistake here. Um, the audience feels it in the same way. When, they're, when the audience is starting to get shoved around and things like that, they feel like, oh, OK. They feel like they're really in that situation. I didn't know that was going to happen. That was really lucky. <laughs> <laughs> um, I want to switch gears to talk about some of the, the economic context in the music business. Um, stuff, streaming music services. Um, some of them uh, you have in Canada, some you haven't gotten yet, but some of the big ones are Spotify, Pandora, RDO, Rhapsody, uh, Google has one. Kind of every big tech company in the world seems to be getting into this. Um, and from a consumer point of view, um, these things kind of feel like a dream come true, that, you know, that they're based on the idea that pretty much any song you can think of um, is instantly available um, in, a, in a high quality, legal, uh, free way for the most part, um, although there are these subscription plans. But you have been one of the, um, I, I could say one of a handful, but really it's been a growing chorus of musicians now who has been speaking out uh, saying that there's, there's a problem here and that maybe these services that seem so great for the consumers uh, aren't so great for, for artists. Tell us about sort of how you came to that and wh what you feel about it. OK. Well, first of all, I'm uh, not in a good position to complain because I kind of, relatively speaking, did OK in the music business. When, when there was money to be made in the music business, I did OK. I owned my, owned my apartment in New York which is uh, kind of something. So I was really lucky. Didn't have huge, huge hits one after another like some people did, but did all right. And uh, so I'm not complaining. <laughs> I think we'll all agree with that. But. Yeah. Uh, so there you go. And, uh, but I noticed that younger musicians coming up um, and musicians who are kind of uh, doing maybe more trying to survive doing more unusual things and push the envelope a little bit more, they're having, they're having a really hard time now for all sorts of reasons. But it, it occurred to me that, uh, well, we've all seen like the decline in CD sales and the down, download sales didn't quite replace that. But some of that you kind of go, OK, CDs were way overpriced anyway. And maybe there was a, a rebalancing was in order. But it seemed to me that the streaming thing, I just, I, I'm still trying to get the numbers, uh, which is, it's, this has been going on for years now. I'm trying to get really a clear sense of the numbers for myself, just so I can say, this is what, this is how many streams I got. This is what I got from it. But it seems like, it's, in general, it's very low. Um, it's not enough for an emerging musician to make a living on, which a lot of people will say, well, tough. Go out and play some gigs or get a, um, get a sponsorship or do, get your songs on a commercial or whatever, which is OK. OK, that's a mean response, but it's OK. <laughs> It's not entirely wrong, but I just thought, OK, but that is a, that is, this is a major, major change. Uh, maybe, it's not, it's, maybe it's not the end of the world for musicians, but it is certainly, to my way of thinking, looking at the kind of monetary thing, I think it's the end of the world of musicians actually making a living from their recordings, um, which is not the end of music by any means. Uh, 
yeah, Rufus and everybody else, and me included, had a wonderful time last night performing. Um, yeah, we weren't selling records or anything like that, but. But that's a, I mean, that's a big statement. Um, but what, like what I, you made. when you look at how low these numbers are, and you look at where the shift is going, with the down, now downloads, as CDs drop, now downloads are dropping, and although many people deny it, it seems like it's dropping because when I talk to some of my friends, they go, oh no, I don't buy any downloads anymore. I just get listen to it free on one of the streaming services. And I go, wait a minute, you don't even pay, you don't even subscribe to the streaming service? It's only like $10 or something. It's, um, no, everybody's going for f the internet concept of free. And, mm -hmm. um, which is something people got used to on the internet. You know, Google gives you your email for free. You get to search the web for free. You get this and that for free. Granted, they got their, their hands up your ass and they are working the puppet <laughs> as fast as I <they> can. <laughs> but, so far, that doesn't hurt too much. <laughs> well, I mean, th this is a, um, in, in the music business, I mean, this is a, a really weird and interesting uh, time and a sort of, sort of a crisis. Maybe it's possibly on the dawn of some new thing. I mean, when you talk to people at the big record companies, for example, they're very excited about streaming. They think it's a great thing and they seem to think you know, finally, we seem to have settled into something that kind of works here. And maybe if, it, maybe if it really builds up, it can keep the lights on around here. But when you talk to musicians, they're biting their nails. And they're saying, mm -hmm. you know, I, I see the, uh, the amount of money. I see some of the money that I get. Um, and just to explain some of this, if, if you're not familiar with it, um, usually when a, when a musician sells a CD, you know, there, there's, a, there's the cut that the retailer takes and the cut that the record company takes and another maybe cut or two in there. And their royalty brings them maybe, maybe a buck if they've, yeah. right, if they've recouped all of their the money that they owe. In a download, you know, the, the price is even lower, so the cut gets even lower. Now we're in a, another stage where every time you click play on Spotify or YouTube or Pandora or something, there's a fraction of a penny um, that is supposed to be making its way through the system. So there's this kind of general reduction of the orders of magnitude of just how much, how much money there is going in there. Um, and then at the same time, you also have the consumers who feel like, well, it's pretty much free. So we, we seem to be hitting and he heading into some kind of uh, weird collision here where, you know, some, something's got something's to give, something's got to happen mm -hmm. with all of the economics here. Um, okay, let me, I'll back up a little from some of the things you were saying a little bit. Um, I think the record companies like it for, as far as I can tell, a couple of reasons. They see it as an, a, an alternative to piracy mm -hmm. in a way. They see it as at least there's some money coming in. Um, and, and if people are, feel like they can consume music for free or for very little money, they might be willing to do that and it might stop the, them just going to pirate sites and getting their media stuff that way. And there's Which is good, right? I, I think that's good. I think there's, and there might be some truth to that. Um, the other reason I think they support it is because they're, it sounds like conspiracy theor theorists, but they are in league, they, they are investors. The big record labels are investors in the streaming companies. Um, they don't get paid, they get paid when songs get streamed because they're the owners of the recordings. The record companies are the owners of the recordings, not the artists in general. And, but they, so they don't get, paid twice, they get paid for that, but then as investors, they own a percentage of stock. So that as Silicon Valley companies tend to do, they exist for until they're maybe three years old and then they cash in. 
uh, and suddenly this company that's only been around for three years, can barely walk, is worth $20 billion. And the record companies know that when that happens, this, these bits of stock that they own will be worth billions. Um, they'll cash in. They don't have to share any of that with the artists. So, Which that, means that the third of a penny doesn't really matter very much. To, to the record companies, yeah. it's just like, who cares? The big money is coming down the line. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, that sounds very, very grim. Well, and it is. It is. I mean, it it's is. It's not untrue. I mean, everything you just said is correct. That the big record companies do own uh, equity in uh, many of these services. Um, for example, um, Apple recently bought Beats for three billion dollars. Universal owned a chunk of it, and they made about five hundred million dollars on that deal. Mm -hmm. And um, I think you're right that they don't have to split that money with anybody. Not if it's stock stuff. No, they right. don't. Um, so that would seem to set up yet another conflict with, with artists. Um, a year or so ago, you wrote a piece um, for The Guardian um, in which you talked about sort of this system developing and the, and, and the way streaming works and the idea that if streaming uh, sort of becomes this, the next big thing, um, you said, quote, the internet will suck all the creative content out of the whole world <laughs> until nothing is left. That's a, and Which of course, is a, that became the headline. That became the headline. <laughs> That's a zinger. That's a good quote. Um, but, it, but, but uh, and I was like, like, not like saying, oh, this is incredibly evil and it's whatever, but I was just kind of, I guess I was just saying, I don't know all the details, but when I kind of look at the math, this is what I get that there's no way that this is sustainable. And then you look at other things, too, and you go, OK. I mean, I'm, I think I brought up other kinds of media, like uh, movies. And you mm -hmm. go, OK, let's say people are getting their movies, and a lot of my friends do, or they're watching their movies on Amazon Prime or something like that. So they pay maybe $100 a year for that, maybe, something like that. Netflix, I don't know what they pay. It's around that. Yeah, something like that for a year. And you go, OK, now let's imagine that that's like music. Um, OK, these people don't go to the movie th theaters anymore. They don't buy DVDs. They don't rent DVDs. They don't, this is their only way they consume films and television or whatever. And you just go, that's, that's not enough money to finance, well, certainly not Batman or Transformers, but even. <laughs> Even medium level movies, you just go, that's not enough money in the kitty to, yeah. to fund that. Or pay uh, an orchestra, you know, um, union wages to record a record, you yeah. know, that kind of stuff. Yes, uh, yeah. Um, I mean, you know, I, I, I see a lot of the same stuff that you do with this, and it's also, it's, it, it can be very alarming. But when I read this, this piece of yours, I also thought about, um, after Napster and in the sort of you know early mid years of the 2000s, there there was a similar sort of um, fear that was out there that uh oh if the money starts to vanish from the world of recordings then people are going to stop making music that the economic incentive will disappear and where's the music going to come from but that hasn't happened and you know it's it's it hard to really come by any real numbers about this but. Mm -hmm. You know, I think in my gut, I kind of feel like people still make music. You know, people, they like yes. lots of music. Um, yeah, I, I agree. People still make music, and they, I think they'll continue to make music. Um, it's part of what we are as whatever, a species, as, as, as a culture, and other cultures too. It may not be in recorded form, because, or if it is, it might be done on people's laptops as opposed to in recording studios with lavish budgets. Um, that's not the end of the world. People will still make music. They might, it might, recorded music's only been around for, well, as a commercial entity for 100 years or so. Uh, so it's a relatively new thing. It could be, okay, oh, that was just a blip. Recorded music as a, as a thing is gone and we're back to, playing pianos and guitars and singing in our parlors um, and getting together with friends and making music. And I thought, 
that could be a good thing. Um, music existed in that kind of way for a long, long time. Uh, I'm not thrilled about the, uh, the model that sometimes gets proposed of the, whatever, the Medici model of, well, if you want to survive and do things, you have to get support from some big corporation and uh, that will kind of pay you to make these deaths. Some, something smells funny about that. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, I do work. It, it does concern me. I'm, I'm kind of curious if uh, emerging musicians will hang in there uh, for more than a few years. I, I do have a sense that some of them, that after, I don't know, 10 years of, of trying to make a living with music, uh, in a kind of conventional sense, and then watching kind of the, mm -hmm. everything kind of going mm -hmm. over the cliff, they go, um, maybe I should be making artisanal uh, cheese on toast. <laughs> That's where the real money is. <laughs> I wonder if you, if you think back to sort of how you got into, into the music business and in making music, um, if you were in the same kind of situation now as a young musician, what would you have been able to do or not do? I mean, would there still have been a Talking Head 77 and, you know, like the record as a sort of big statement that says, like, I'm here, this is what I can do, you know, this is Psycho Killer, check it out, you know, um, is that going to disappear? I don't know. Uh, this, yeah. So I'm, maybe I'm being overly alarmist, but. Um, with Talking Heads, we got to the point where we could actually pay our rent um, and our food just from the gigging in little clubs, uh, CBGBs, and I think we've played in, up here in, played up in Toronto and Boston and, you know, just around, which was kind of rare uh, that we could get to that point. We had not made a record yet, uh, but we could make a living. Granted, living in the United States, we couldn't pay for medical. And uh, if somebody in the band got married and had a child, well, there was no money available for that. But we were doing pretty good. So you could see that that could happen. A band could kind of get a following uh, and build an audience very slowly, little by little, regionally, and then go from there. The record, recording would just be way too expensive unless you kind of did it at a, you know, in a friend's basement or loft or something on kind of home, a laptop or something. Boy, that's kind of scary, though, that uh, you know, I, wasn't, I wasn't there you know, when, you were, when you were playing CBGB. I'm uh -huh. glad that you made the record and that you know, uh, Seymour Stein, uh, Sire Records, said, like, hey, let's Let's take a chance on these guys. It wasn't, and it wasn't a lot. I think it, uh, that first record, might, I think we recorded it in two weeks or maybe less, recorded and mixed probably, and it uh, might have cost $20,000, somewhere like that, something like that. Um, but if you're an emerging artist, that is way more than you can yeah. cough up uh, to make a record and then one, then you wonder, now, are we ever going to see that money back? I wonder if you, if you think there's any you know, positive sign or uh, effects of this streaming stuff. And uh, for example, is there any effect that we're, we're feeling on, on music itself now? That if people are getting music in a different way, if more is available and it's easier to get, is it, is it going to change the way people make music or the way young people learn about music. Have we seen any of that yet? You, I've read things. I haven't experienced this, but I've read things where it's been said, well, this should enable people to discover music mm -hmm. more easily. They'll be more likely to check out something that they hear about or that they're curious about or that they read about because it doesn't cost them anything to, to check it out. Um, and so they'll, they'll become musically more kind of broader in their tastes or their interests. Uh, they'll know more about all different kinds of music because they can. 
I don't know if that's really happening. <laughs> but, but it could. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it, technically, it's possible. Um, there's, yeah, it's kind of a no risk. You can explore and be curious. For, so that could be really good. Are you hopeful about this? I mean, if it, 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 I, I realize you just said this might be the end of the era of recorded music being the, a money-making thing, but are you hopeful about the way young musicians might f form careers now and make their way through all of this? Um, having grown, grown up kind of falling in love with a lot of recorded music and it, having the fact that it, had a lot of meaning for me in my life and a lot of other people's lives. I think I'd miss, I'd miss that. Um, but I think in other ways, I could see that the idea of communal music making, people actually going back and making music with one another and, and becoming a part of their social lives, not just consuming it as something that you stream or download or buy, but as something that everybody participates in or they or their friends participate in or they go to someone's house and people are making music. I thought that could be really a huge social change um, that would bring people together in ways that social networks don't. Do you like any of these streaming services? I mean as a as a place to hang out, uh, you know, uh, uh, as, a, as a way to listen to music, do, do you find them actually Good, enjoyable. It's yeah. It's sort of bad for me to complain because I haven't really tried them. But I mean, I've, I have tried them. I've kind of like yeah. gone through and it, to, to see how it works. Um, there, they each have. There's little differences between them. Um, Doesn't sound like they've wowed you. Uh, I think if I was. If I wasn't a musician and didn't have these other concerns, yeah. as, a, as a general consumer, yeah, I'd be totally into it. I'd be totally into it. Because some of them, um, now you can, I shouldn't be telling everyone this, so you can listen to your music offline. It used to be the streaming music, you had to have a decent internet connection. You can only see, now if you have a playlist, you can just download it onto your, your phone or your tablet or whatever and take it with you, even if you don't have an internet connection. And I just thought, that is amazing. That's the equivalent of you just bought it. You, you own it now, um, sort of. But so I think as a consumer, I'd be totally wowed by that. I think we're almost ready to take questions. So maybe if we get started on that. And I'll ask you one more thing before we go. So to I, we, yeah, I, but I, something, something tells me, just because it's so quiet, that me saying that kind of communal music making might be a good thing, that's, that didn't sound like it was going to like, I don't know if people were buying that <laughs> as being like, OK, no more records, but everybody's going to be sitting around making music anyway. Back to the porch. Back to the porch, or we go hear music, we go hear live music somewhere, and play, some people make live music. Um, it's a little hard to get your head around the idea of, well, there would still be huge pop stars with recordings, but a lot less of other things. It's a little hard to get your head around that, but the, the other thing could be really good, but it's maybe a stretch to imagine that. Well, it also sounds like it, it reflects some of the pitch that we kind of get about some of the, uh, some of the social media services, that these are going to help us all be, they're the, they're, the, they're the playground, they're the water cooler, um, they're they're going to be a new way for all of us to sort of hang out and share our baby pictures and say, what are you doing this weekend? But there's also this sinister side of it where, oh, by the way, it's also a way for Google to sort of snatch every uh, piece of information that you've ever touched. Yeah, and then you know, make money from it. And make money from it and just, you know, you're just going to have to live with that. Yeah, um, that's your trade-off. Yeah. That's the trade-off. Um, OK, so I, I, I'm just curious about this. Since we talked about kind of the big record companies and so forth, we're also at a time now when um, musicians of all kinds, independent musicians, you know, people in their bedroom have all these tools to sort of raise money on Kickstarter and tweet, you know, tweet their stuff and put their music on Bandcamp and everything. There really is um, 
you know, a pretty incredible kind of infrastructure for doing that stuff. And yet these record companies that, especially in the earlier days of the internet, I think there was the expectation that they're all going to crumble into the sea, that we don't really need them anymore. In some ways, they're sort of stronger than ever, especially when you get to this, you know. The pop. Spot. Yeah, the big The pop the stuff, big yeah, yeah, that's stronger than ever. And it, so, it, it's, it's everywhere. So, I mean, do artists really have power, or is it sort of illusory? Like, what is their role in all of this? It's a little bit of both. I mean, some younger artists that I know that I've worked with, some of them have, they're, they're not tempted by the do-it-yourself possibilities. The fact that you can record for very little money and post it up on a website and sell it at your own, on your website or through Bandcamp or any of these other things. They want to be with a record label. They want to have the expertise that comes with that and the, the team backing them and helping them with their promotion and their marketing and everything like that. There's, and there's, there's a truth to that, that, that there's things that uh, we're not good at doing everything, that we shouldn't have to be good at doing everything. Uh, so I, yeah, I, I see that there isn't this mass migration to go, okay, we don't need record labels anymore. No, there's people going, hey, you know, we still need them in some ways. Um, what about I, you? You've sort of been on both sides of it. I've been on both sides. I've done some recent records, kind of do it yourself, and some uh, with with record labels involved. Um, and it's yeah, it's a it varies. Some it's a learning thing. <laughs> Sometimes the do it yourself thing works just fine, or sometimes more than fine. Sometimes because you're not, you, you didn't get an advance from a record label that you have to pay back and all this. Kind of, you actually start, the money starts trickling in if people are buying the record or downloading or anything within like a week of you getting it up online, yeah. which is kind of amazing. Uh, the same thing, though, has its downsides because if people don't find out about the record and don't, <laughs> don't buy it, the, tr the trickle gets turned off <laughs> without kind of any marketing or ads or any of that kind of stuff, which is hard to do when you do all that yourself. OK, let's see. Are there any questions out there? Um, there are microphones. Um, yeah. We just ask, uh, there are a couple rules we, we, need to, we need you to observe, because we want to make sure we get everybody's questions in. Keep your question in the form of an actual question. I know it sounds simple, and keep it snappy. You over here? Hi. Two really quick questions. What's the last vinyl that you bought? And also, Lord tweeted the other day that she wishes you could join Twitter. What's your thoughts on Twitter and social media? Thank you. <laughs> I saw that. I was very flattered that if that was really her. <laughs> um, but <laughs> I just I figured I, I don't have time. I, my, my office does, puts announcements on Twitter and Facebook and stuff, but I thought, oh, I, I kind of enjoy writing kind of long, semi-researched blog posts and things like that. And I thought, okay, maybe that's as far as I'm going to go, and then I'm going to go try and write some more stuff. Uh, I forgot what the other question was. Uh, vinyl. Last vinyl. What's the last vinyl you bought? It's been a while, but I, I mean, I have a record player and play things, but I, it's been a while. Okay, over here. Uh, when you're going out on tour or whatever, how much of an opportunity is there for you to ingest the local music scene? And do you try to take the best advantage that you can of it? There's not, not much chance to hear live, anyway, local music when I'm on tour, because we don't, the economics are, that you have to have as few days off as possible. Um, but as you can imagine, I do get handed records. <laughs> they used to be cassettes. Now it's CDs or something. And um, I've, I actually listen to them. And <laughs> it ends up being a pretty big stack when I get home. And, uh, but I managed to make my way through them. And sometimes there's some really great stuff. And, 
There's usually a, an email address or a website or something on there where you can go, you know, can write back and go, this really love this record. This is really great. Da da da. Yeah. How do how do how do you hand somebody a Spotify stream? Like, is that like are people handing you pieces of papers with links on them now? Like, <laughs> has that happened yet? No, that has okay. not happened yet. We're still in the physical demo tape. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. People page. still do. Yeah, that a physical thing is a a real good kind of exchange of way to hand some a gift to give. Advice from David Byrne. <laughs> um, over here. Two, two quick questions, Ian. On the theme of how streaming is affecting uh, how emerging you know, artists, musicians perform, where, where the audience can pick and choose, dissect a, a piece of work, say it's an album or, or Hear Lives Love, is, do you think that there uh, is the incentive for an emerging artist to actually construct an album uh, oh, okay. That, that has a, a narrative. Yeah, another effect of, this was not even from streaming, but from like uh, iTunes and when you could download individual songs, it became evident that the people were going to cherry pick the songs that they wanted, that they'd heard about the single, and not buy the rest of the album. And which is, okay, so that's not going back 100 years before recorded music. That's going back, what? 50 years mm -hmm. to when singles kind of ruled, ruled the roost and albums were just emerging as a kind of concept uh, yeah, by record companies and a few artists to try and say, oh, look, this is not just a collection of, of whatever, a dozen songs. This is, there's, there's a whole thematic unity here. It's interesting, though, that, you know, it, the 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 single market is you know has driven pop much more you know we have we have Lady Gaga now I mean, she's mm. perfect for the sort of download single age, but the album even for very young bands is still kind of the unit that they use to express themselves and I mean you know Grizzly Bear could have just said why would we ever make an album but they have made numerous really good albums yeah. and said, like, this is, this is what our art form is. And uh, it's, yeah, there's some artists, I, I mean, I'm guilty of it too, where there's some artists where I'll just go, oh, yeah, I want to hear that single. But there's other ones where I go, no, I have to kind of live with the whole album. And then if I want to dump some of the songs later, that's my business. But I, I want to check it out as a, as a whole thing. But one, I mean, one thing occurs to me that um, from a marketing point of view and a kind of promotion and all that sort of thing, it costs as much to market a single as it does an album. Um, so naturally, uh, if an artist, if you can get people to, if you can get people to pay, what, eight ninety nine for an album, they want. They want to use the, uh, their marketing budget and their promotional budget and their PR budget and everything like that to get people to buy the whole album. But um, that doesn't seem to be happening as often now. We had is, one more little yeah, question. Quick question. I don't know, David, if you remember a night with uh, you and one of your bands in Vancouver at the UBC Observatory. I know uh, uh, before one of your shows in Vancouver. And I know how much you follow and research science and other disciplines. Uh, but I've never been able to figure out how I your knowledge and interest in pure science informs your music and, and, and comes out in it, uh, if it does. I don't know if it does either. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll say that the, the last chapter of this book um, is called Harmonia Mundi. And uh, it's a fascinating chapter because it, it is in some ways about the scientific or even kind of spiritual, if you don't mind my yeah, going yeah, there, yeah, no. side of just what is music and where does it come from and how, how have just even the vibrations of harmonies sort of been understood and delineated throughout history. Um, and uh, in, I mean, it's in a, in a way, it, it really is a kind of science mm -hmm. of what music is all about. Prior to the, the Renaissance, it was, in, in general, it was felt that the world worked according to musical principles. That if you could understand 
the way music worked, I'm not plugging my book, but um, <laughs> in, the, in the greater sense of so the music of the spheres and the, the way harmonies work and all that kind of stuff, everything else, the way plants branch off, the measurement of people, the kind of the proportions of our bodies, it was felt that everything was according to some musical harmony and proportion. And then somewhere at the Renaissance, it, it, it all just went kablooey, and it was felt like, no, music is a reflection of some other greater scientific order. It, but that's only, it, but the, world doesn't, is, the world is not musical. Music is part of the world. So it got, got turned around. But yeah, so that, uh, that was a huge, huge change in the way kind of we conceive of the world. It's still there when, you, when we hear about the, the harmony of the spheres and mm -hmm. those sorts of things. It's still, the language is still sort of with us from yeah. a remnant of that. Over here. Yeah. Uh, so since a lot of these streaming services are still in their infancy, could you see possibly down the road them creating original content, like a lot like Netflix does with you know, House of Cards or you know, uh, Orange is the New Black, but them almost becoming, I don't know, that kind of person that is between the artists and actually creating content? Like record companies, maybe. Like a record company, yeah. Um, would Apple decide to be a record company, sort of? I don't see why not. Uh, I mean, doesn't Amazon do like pay for pay very little, maybe, but for uh, what are they called? Amazon singles, or mm -hmm. and they've done kind of paid for some original books that are only published on Amazon or something like that. Doesn't make, every audience isn't happy about that, but yeah, I could see that that could. Would that be a good thing if that happened? The Amazon mo model is a little bit weird because it, it's like, because there's always these format issues where it's because, yes, we're funding your band, but it only plays on our system. <laughs> your, your fans can only listen to it if they buy our app and subscribe to our thing, which if it gets into that, it's just like pure evil. <laughs> uh, two questions. Um, hi, how are you? <laughs> and two, uh, do you think you'll ever do another musical? Yeah, I'm writing. I really enjoyed the experience. It was a little too long. I was about eight or nine years from to, you know, beginning to getting it up and running. But I'm, yeah, I'm writing another one. I'm, I got a draft through Act One now, so I'll just keep plugging away. My, I, I'm, I'm hoping within a year, there's it, at least a workshop or something. Cool. Eight or nine years. So isn't that long? But I did. I mean, I did books and tours and other records and all sorts of things in between all that because I could tell that. Okay, you know, plug away at it for a while. No luck or it just seemed to be going wrong, so I back on the shelf and then... I mean, that. when you started it, did you pretty much have an idea of the way it would go? Like, did, did you know it was going to be, sort of, you know, have, a, have a disco yeah, theme yeah. to it? Yeah, oh okay. yeah, yeah, that was all given. I, um, of course, as, when we actually started doing workshops and, and rehearsing it, I, I knew, okay, a bunch of these songs are gonna get chucked out because they don't really advance the narrative. They give you kind of depth and other peripheral characters and things. But uh, that's going to go. And so, but in, and I knew that I'd have to write new stuff too. So it was a whole process. It was not kind of like, there it is, it's done. So you're doing it again though? I'm going to try. I'm trying. Yeah, yeah. I haven't made any money, real money on that. <laughs> Other one yet. You know, I'm hoping I can figure out. How to Soundtrack do that. is in stores now. Yeah. Uh, over here. Uh, yesterday I gave you a very well designed piece of paper with a link on it. So I'm happy to be All a right. guinea pig for that movement if you want. <laughs> uh, about 30 years ago, you directed a feature film called True Stories, and it's amazing. Yes. Thank Are you. we going to see any reissue, remaster, remake presence around True Stories for its birthday? And would you make another movie? Um, 
it's been a whole kind of negotiation, try, trying to get it kind of re-released, -re re-repackaged, all that kind of thing. So yes, I hope so, but who knows? Um, <laughs> do, do another one? Uh, well, I kind of got my, I got my plate full right now. I'm, <laughs> for the next year or two, I'm doing another uh, a project that will be here again next summer, another Luminato thing on it that's yeah. so um, so stop making sense um, it came out oh, yeah, I coming. think thirty years ago, uh -huh. and then true stories after that. You made a documentary about Brazil some yeah, point after about that. Right? Uh, Kendon Blades, yeah. Um, I mean, was it a good experience to make movies, or was that something that made you want to sort of walk away from oh, the Oh, it was a really, it was a wonderful experience. Yeah, I loved it. I loved it. I mean, you can, uh, directing, you, you're God. You can, you can tell, <laughs> you can decide how somebody's house looks, um, what they, the words that come out of their mouth, <laughs> everything. Did you, so, say, did you say cut? And <laughs> rolling, go and stop. And <laughs> um, yeah, I felt uncomfortable saying action and cut. Um, I've got to go. Okay, that was good. But uh, yeah, it was a wonderful experience. I think I I got seduced uh, from the little bit of success I had there. I got seduced um, into kind of going around LA kind of pitching other, uh, other ideas um, hmm. and going the whole development thing. Because with that one, I kind of basically just did it myself with a, some other friends and some help. But I didn't like go to a studio and say, uh, or a pr production agency or whatever and say, can I, I want to have money to develop my idea. I just went and did it until, so that, which is what I did with the musical too. Kind of wrote it myself. Didn't like go to someone and go, "Can you fund it, fund this? I have yeah. an idea." Yeah. So uh, I kind of spent a couple of years just kind of running around doing pitches and realized I could have been writing songs instead of going to meetings. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Next question. Hi. First of all, thank you for last night. Thank you. <laughs> and. Um, a question for each of you. What do you think of the singing and songwriting competition shows like The Voice and The Idol shows? And that's a question for each of you, please. Do you want to go first? I, I'm not that familiar with them. Um, well, I mean, I, I don't really enjoy them as music that much. And I think it's interesting that, you know, um, American Idol has been on TV for 13 seasons, I think. and you know, it, it sort of it fulfilled its promise a few times in sort of creating a star. You know, Carrie Underwood, Kelly Clarkson, and but then like Jennifer Rodson didn't win, but she wound up sort of becoming a, you know, a star Hollywood out of star. that. Um, I think it shows the limitations of, of what they can do, but um, I think it's also worth remembering that like at the time they started, the music business was really freaking out about, you know, the, the sky is falling here. And they saw that as a way to sort of get promotion and like maybe we can try this thing where we're going to sort of, you know, breed people on TV and see how that works. And it worked okay, but I mean, my own feeling is that it just doesn't really seem like it's, it, it's, it's still sort of paying dividends. And yet it's, there's, there's still like five of them, right? So I mean, that's my two cents about it. I, I, I mean, I'm aware of some of these artists that emerge out of that, but I haven't, don't think I've seen any of those shows. Um, there's also the Eurovision Song oh, Contest. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, have, I mean, I've watched, you know, some of the acts from the past. It was some incredibly bizarre Ukrainian act. Which is what's so great about it. <laughs> Unlike American Idol, it's just like, do your weirdest, you know, yeah, do, yes. do something yeah, yeah. crazy and maybe you'll win. I think that's America's Got Talent is, is okay. one of those ones. Anyway, thank you. 
Thank you. Uh, all right, next. To what extent does what you said about collaboration apply to your fellow musicians in Talking Heads, a band in which many of us felt passionately enjoined to a driven, idiosyncratic genius? Uh, I, very much. Uh, in different kinds of collaboration, when you're working with the band, I think um, in the beginning, I was writing more of the material and then bringing it to the band, and the band would then we start to rehearse it. But even in that process, uh, the kind of things they would play, the way they would play, all that kind of stuff affects the, the finished thing. It wasn't just like, it wasn't me dictating every, everything that everyone did. Um, and then you start to unconsciously write knowing that this is the, the, the drummer doesn't play this kind of stuff. He'll play this kind of stuff. So write things that are like this. And, and that'll, that'll work. And you know, you start to write a little bit with the, the kind of band in mind. And then later on, we went into a kind of songwriting thing where the, the band would improvise stuff. Uh, and generally, I would kind of take the cassette tapes and kind of say, OK, if we play this bar, this couple of bars here, and then this bar, bars here, and then these, well, we, can, we can kind of make a song structure out of it. So there was a kind of, then there was a real kind of group, group collaboration uh, thing going on in some of the, some of the songwriting. Um, it only worked for certain kinds of material. So after a while, you kind of wear it out. But it, Do you miss having a set band like that, whether it's that band or a different one where you know, it's like these four people are the unit that makes all the music? Or do you like having sort of different groups of people for different things? I kind of like having different groups of people that, and now I, know, I kind of know a kind of wide range of musicians that are good at different things. But, but there's there's a lot of truth to that. That uh, people who kind of work with a, a core group of musicians and they know what's going to happen there. Okay, over here, right? Hi, David. <clears throat> Considering how music is consumed in a modern context. How important do you think it is for emerging artists to create visual representations like album art and video to accompany their music? Um, to, in my opinion, they, they, they do that. Uh, they don't all make videos. I mean, I think it was, what, Lana Del Rey? Would, did she edit her own video, that one that kind of, the video games thing that kind of broke, broke her? I mean, that was, it was the, I think the video was what everybody started seeing. But not everybody is good at that or has an idea of that. But I think every, every act has an idea of how they want to look and how they want to be and how they want to present themselves. And they may want to, I you know, I'm guilty of this where I've decided at some point I don't want to look like I've made any decision about how I look. <laughs> 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 I want to have kind of the no look look, but that's impossible. But that ends up that ends up being something too. <laughs> and, um, yeah, I th and I think it's inevitable that musical artists in inevitably brings some kind of visual aspect of what they do. It might just be yeah, I want a white piano, but. It's something, yeah. So, I mean, in, in, in a way, have that, have that hasn't diminished, that the idea that, you know, there's, there's the music and there's various other kinds of representations that an artist will use, you know, the, their cover art, their name, you know, sort of their media persona. Um, has that even increased in, over the years? I don't it's think so. I mean, I think, but I think in a good way, I think it's some of it has fallen back into the hands of the artists. The artists, mm. if they want to, can choose to do that themselves or bring their friends in to make their videos or their clothes or whatever. That, that, 
Yes. So that, that kind of thing is really good that they can do that. You said before that you're not really into the social media stuff. Does that wind up also becoming kind of one of those like reflections of like, here's my video, here's my cover art, here's the way I tweet, you know? A lot of especially younger artists, that's sort of just that's who they are, and they're they're on they're online all the time, expressing themselves and sort of forming a uh, a persona. I think you're right. Yeah, I think that's I, you're you're right. I mean, I, I remember this was probably a couple of years ago. There was like this internet thing of, look, here's Kanye's tweets, and it was, everybody's going to read Kanye's tweets now. And <laughs> they were pretty insane, but. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, okay. Well. Uh, my question is around uh, your intention and purpose, specifically uh, over time. You talked about uh, the narrative or the arc of various projects, and so I'm wondering if you were to arc your, uh, your intention from the earliest parts of your career through various projects, how that's changed over time. You talked about various drivers, architecture, uh, economics, technology, you know, those are maybe macro things that affect the whole industry, but maybe you talk about some of the, maybe the micro things personally as well. So I imagine what drove you the initial stuff in talking heads or when you were first in school to mid career to now what's happening. Can you talk about intention over time? That could be really long, but I'll try, I'll try and do a short version. I, I have a sense that with the early material that I was writing and performing, a lot of it with talking heads, that um, I was very introverted, very shy, and that so the material had this weird kind of um, desperation in it, but I was also very kind of slightly cold and rigorous at the same time, so you, which made for a really interesting tension. Um, in some of that material. And so the, I think the performances with that small group were, there was a, the early stuff was really about that kind of psychology and that kind of, that kind of tension going on. Later, there was, I think there was a big shift when the band transitioned into being kind of a, a, a kind of large, whatever, Afro-funk, whatever, yeah. outfit, which I think the first time we did it was here at Kingsway? Kingsway. Yeah. Kingswood. Kingswood. Yeah. I was Thank there. you. Um, and th that was completely liberating. It, we, it, I realized that music doesn't have to be about your own personal psychology. It can be about this kind of group community, community experience, this ecstatic group, kind of lose yourself in the community experience. And that became a thing for a while, and um, well, I've gone on to do other things. <laughs> it, it, it seems you've got more idiosync, more, more narrow, and you have sort of maybe the luxury to pursue unique ideas of your own. Maybe early on it was more mass oriented, or was that just an accident? That happened to be what you were doing, and it, it hit with a broad audience. Um, I always, I try to make everything I do pretty much accessible. That doesn't mean it's going to be successful or it's going to be uh, that a, a, a large audience is going to buy into it, but, uh, but I, I try not to make anything that pushes people away, sonically or, I mean, you know, it's not, there are certain kinds of people that make music that is ten, intentionally kind of sounds like it's, it's, it's distancing you. And I try to go, no, 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 I want you, I want you to like this. Um, even if it's a little unusual, there's, I feel like there's an accessible level to it. It doesn't always succeed or in the marketplace, but that's sometimes, you know, as an artist, I feel like sometimes that's my fault. I didn't do something right. Sometimes it's the fault of what, of the arc of my career that, when you're younger, you're more newsworthy, and, it's more, and there's more of a buzz going on, and uh, all, you know all sorts of factors. But um, I don't think that part. Of course, my writing has changed, but I don't think that that 
That part of it, of having it be accessible, has changed at all. <laughs> I thought. Uh, yeah, I thought the most the most accessible pop songs I'd ever written were written for this kind of disco musical. I thought these are real catchy pop songs. How I mean, there are they do occasionally. You know, you'll have this very emotional poppy melody that all of a sudden references some island in the Philippines, which may that may have affected the, its chances. In the, <laughs> Be able to get picked up in a Honda commercial. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I have a little follow-up to that, a little bit of a tangent, but I, I know exactly what you mean about sort of early on, you kind of had this psychological character that was kind of bursting out. And mm -hmm. at, at some point, you also, you know, to, for, for me, and I think a lot of other fans of yours, you also kind of became this, like, guide to cool stuff. You know, that like you started a record company that put out oh, yeah, a bunch of cool thing. Brazilian music that otherwise I probably never would have heard of. You collaborated with all kinds of interesting people. And so you're kind of a gateway drug to all kinds of neat <laughs> stuff. Were you conscious of that? Was, that? was that a deliberate move of, you know, I'm going to use my fame to sort of open up, you know, avenues to other kinds of things, or I'm going to introduce other things to people, or, or did you just say, I want to start a record company and put out a Brazilian album? Yeah, well, I didn't start it for money, but, I, but it's, it's, I did realize that I had enough of a name that I could do that, and some people might be interested. Um, and then if I made, like if the Brazilian collections and some of the other stuff was sort of accessible, then it was going to be like, OK, he's not foisting you know, his the weirdest thing he can think of. He's not showing off how weird he can be or how obscure he can be. It's, this is stuff that if people give it a chance, they often really like it. Um, and then I, would, then I would throw in the Tom Zay record. The, go, okay, but there is some weird stuff that you need to hear. <laughs> um, yeah, I was aware that I, I was using, you know, the, whatever attention I could get to do that, but also realize that it's delicate. You can't. You can betray that trust, and if you betray that trust, mm -hmm. the, the, or whatever the public or the audience has, then you're kind of screwed. It's really. I imagine it's really hard to get that back. I think we have time for one more question, and you're the lucky contestant over there. Well, there won't be a lot of arts, but we'll just uh, keep it simple. First of all, thank you for continuing to bring your fascinating art and all the dimensions that you have to our city, so please keep doing it. We really appreciate it. And given it's Father's Day, happy Father's Day, David. And oh, what's the you. best part about being a dad? <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> um. I'm really lucky my daughter lives with me when she's not staying at her boyfriend's house. And um, yeah, I'm also really lucky that sometimes she wants to do things with me. <laughs> and uh, it just kind of blows my mind sometimes. I thought, wow. Is this poor girl forced to listen to Tom Zay records and all kinds of weird things? <laughs> I think she passed on the Tom Zay records. Um, but she, yeah, she was around. I mean. Tom Zay stayed at our house some of the times when he was coming through New York. So she was aware, of, definitely aware of Tom Zay. <laughs> OK. Um, any, anything else about being a father? No. no. OK. <laughs> That's good. Well, all right. David, thank you very much. And thank you all for a great question. Thank you.